to send me to parochial schools, John Carroll High School in the district, and the Johns Hopkins University on $3.83 an hour. I would go on to attend Georgetown University Law School and while my sister Monica became the doctor in the family. So I think I know something about confronting the odds. In 2002, I was approached by then Congressman Bob Ehrlich to run with him as his lieutenant governor. It was an uphill battle. No Republican had won the governorship of Maryland since Spiro Agnew. I'm not saying something. More importantly, we ran against Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, the daughter of Robert F. Kennedy and Uncle Teddy's little niece. We ran an unconventional campaign that wooed a number of Democrats to our side. We built coalitions and met with a diverse community of civic, religious, and political leaders in their neighborhoods and places of worship. On election night, when the votes were counted, we made history by becoming the first Republican ticket in 40 years and beating back the status quo thinking that it could not be done. So I know a little something about winning against the odds. I wanted to begin this reflection with this reflection to create the context for what comes next. Lessons learned. Lessons that have shaped me as your chairman and that will shape us as a party. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, we are at a crucial juncture for our party and more importantly for our country. Simply put, America needs us now more than ever before. It's time, it's time for us to rise to the occasion. It's time to make our voices heard. It's time to serve our country as the loyal opposition. Now we all realize that the Democrats want us to be silent. They want to diminish our voice. And they even want to try to suggest that by being the loyal opposition, we are in some ways being less than patriotic. You've heard the suggestion that if we oppose the president's policies, we are in some crazy way rooting against American success. But we also know nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, we would be abandoning our responsibility if we were to be silent while they spend our country into the abyss, while they borrow money we do not have, and while they usher in the most massive, expansive uh, expansion of federal government control in the history of the Republic. Well, today, I have news for them. We are not going to be silent. We're going to speak up. And we're going to show that we have the courage of our convictions. We will not be afraid to agree with the President when we believe he is doing what is in the best interest of this country. And neither will we be afraid to disagree with the President when we believe his actions are hurting our country. It is time to talk. It is time to talk to you about some very important turning points for our party. The first turning point is this. Today, we are declaring an end to the era of Republicans looking backwards. We have just endured two successive elections where we were soundly defeated. As a result, many of us, me included, have done some soul searching. We have looked closely at the places we went wrong. We have talked openly and publicly about our mistakes and our deficiencies. If you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to repeat it. This has indeed been a difficult, yet I think healthy and necessary task for the party. People are sick and tired of politicians and political parties who never own up to their mistakes. We have done so. We lost our way on spending and we owned up to that. We came to Washington to change it and in some ways we let Washington change us. We owned up to that. We've taken some important steps to recover our values and our senses, and we can say we see the world with a clearer head and a sharper vision. 
the era of apologizing for Republican mistakes of the past is now officially over. It is done. The time for trying to fix or focus on the past has ended. The era of Republican navel-gazing, done. We have turned the corner on regret, recrimination, self-pity, and self-doubt. Now is the hour to focus all of our energies on winning the future. The Republican Party is again going to emerge as the party of new ideas. It will take some time for sure, there's no doubt about that. But it is beginning now. It is beginning with us. It is beginning with you. Our governors are emerging with fresh answers to old problems. Some of our brightest stars in Congress are emerging with new approaches. New groups and new entities are being transformed and developed across the country. Republicans are rising once again with the energy, the focus, and the determination to turn our timeless principles into new solutions for the future. The introspection, ladies and gentlemen, is now over. The corner has been turned. The second turning point for our party is this. We're going to take the president head on. The honeymoon is over. The two-party system, the two-party system is making a comeback and that comeback begins today. The Democrats are in power. They wanted it, and now we're going to make them own up to the results of their arrogance of power, policies that are hurting the long-term health of our country. We're going to give voice to the growing chorus of Americans who realize that there is a difference between creating wealth and redistributing wealth. Simply put, Simply put, we are going to speak truth to power. There's been a great deal of talk in Republican circles about how we should deal with President Obama and the entire Obama phenomenon. Many have suggested that we need to be careful, that we need to tiptoe around President Obama, that we have to be careful not to take him on, at least not directly. This has led to some hand-wringing among some Republicans and quite frankly, I think some missed opportunities. We've seen strategists writing memos and doing briefings, urging the Republicans avoid confronting the president, steer clear of any frontal assaults on his administration. They suggest that instead we should go after Nancy Pelosi, who nobody likes, or Harry Reid, who nobody knows, or this Tim Geithner fellow, whom nobody believes, or maybe even Barney Frank, whom nobody understands. In the same way that the Democrats target, of cons target conservative talk show hosts and former vice presidents, we should also engage in some misdirection, just like they do. The argument goes that we should be careful here because the polls suggest the President Obama is popular. Well, the President is personally popular. Pity the poor fool who paid money to get that poll. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. Folks like him. He's got an easy demeanor. He's a great orator. His campaign style is wonderful. His campaign was based on change and hope. He's young, he's cool, he's hip. He's got a good looking family. What's not to like? He's got all the qualities America likes in celebrity, so of course he's going to be popular. Only one problem. He's taking us in the wrong direction and bankrupting our country. That I do not like. <laughs> this, popular, this popular politician who is our president is engaged in the most massive expansion of the old industrial age model of government that our country has ever seen. This popular politician is spending America into debt of such mammoth proportions that none of us can even begin to fathom its true cost. Nor can we understand fully why it is being done in the first place. The numbers are so big that they seem impossible.